New York. This city really does never sleep. It's always open for business. A global center for finance and trade working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The beating heart of the heaving metropolis is New York Harbor. The $500 million worth of goods that arrives here every day is the lifeblood of the city's economy. But a major artery is blocked. The natural depth of the harbor is as low as six meters. Massive ships like the MSC Tomoko, due to dock in two days' time, need twice that depth to avoid running aground. The harbor authorities are fighting a constant battle to keep it deep enough to handle the world's biggest cargo ships. New York City is in a hole, and there's only one machine that can dig them out of it. The New York Backhoe Dredger. Length, 60 meters. Weight, 1,500 tons. The gigantic bucket can dig to depths of 25 meters to bring up a mix of mud and hard rock from the harbor floor. Crew. Captain of this monster dredge, Kurt Hill. Sometimes I have to give these guys a little tough love. You know, they're all good guys, but sometimes you gotta push them. Dredge operator and the man behind the wheel of this mean machine, Val Alesnovich. This is my office right here. It's like a video game. In New York Harbor, the heat is on. And not just for the dredger crew. The whole city is in the grip of a sizzling heat wave. Outdoor temperatures are reaching a mind-boggling 43 degrees Celsius. In parts of the dredger, it's 10 degrees hotter. Before the New York dredge can begin the day's first shift of digging, operator Val must move the monster into position. The dredge is anchored to the sea floor by three column-like stakes known as spuds. Standing at 30 meters tall and made from reinforced steel, these huge towers of strength weigh in at 110 tons. The two front spuds are the anchors. The rear spud, known as the walking spud, is responsible for moving the dredge forward. Every time the 1,500-ton dredge moves forward, the spud is subjected to incredible friction and massive shearing forces. The crew is supposed to keep the spud constantly lubricated, but they've been working flat out for days. I thought I asked you to grease this. Well, we did it yesterday. You need to do it again. Why have we got to keep see, on greasing? You see that list down in the galley? Tells you what to do every day? This is on that list. I want you to gather up your tools, dock, get up here, well, and let's get these greased. Well, seems like we're the only watch that does it, though. Lubricating the dredge's spuds is a hard, unpleasant job, but Captain Kurt Hill knows there could be serious consequences if it's not done. I didn't ask for no lip. Just get up there and get the job done. The disgusting blue slime is a heavy-duty synthetic lubricant. A coating of this stuff prevents friction damage and minimizes corrosion from the harbor's salt water. This mate, he wasn't following the rules, he wasn't following the list of what he's supposed to do. I had to get out of there, I had to give him a little tough love. You know, we gotta get, get the job done. We gotta make sure the equipment's in good operating condition. You know, that's why we're here. Make sure we get on there nice and thick. We get all that bare metal covered up. With the spud safely covered, the dredge can make its move to the digging channel. They can't afford to waste time arguing. Jobs don't come any bigger than this. The project to dredge the harbor channels between Brooklyn, Staten Island, and New Jersey is worth millions of dollars to the New York Dredging Company. Just as the digging crew starts to get into a groove, Chief Engineer Jack Smallwood spots something disturbing. I just saw something missed out behind you. Yeah, I also saw power up here. The New York dredge comes to a grinding halt. 
something is fire, right? Fire. Smoking on the back of the excavator. The massive machine is on fire. Heilbronnerland, southern Germany. The region's railway network is vital for trade and commerce. But the rusting tracks are 80 years old and desperately need replacement. Thousands of commuters rely on these trains for getting to work. The Heilbronn car factory, the area's biggest employer, depends on freight trains to get their cars out to dealerships. And there's only enough storage space at this factory for three days of production. The railway work crews have just three days to replace six kilometers of rail, 24,000 sleepers, 100,000 bolts, and 120,000 tons of ballast. That kind of work is going to take something extraordinary. The RU-800S, or Minka to the men who work the rails. One and a half kilometers of rolling factory capable of making a whole new railway. Weight, 1,400 tons. Engine, 3,500 horsepower. Crew, 40. Minka can strip old track and sleepers, clean and replace ballast, and lay down a new railway, and she can do it all without stopping. Minka, ultimate multitasker. Crew, manager Hannes Gamlinger feels the need for speed. And when Minka needs fixing, engineer Wolfgang Kollau gets down and dirty. Very good machine, very, very good. 6 a.m. Morning, and all you The day starts with a pep talk for the team. Bauen wollen wir heute zwei Kilometer. They've got to hit two kilometers of track every day, or well, the car factory is going to get traffic jammed. The 3,500 horsepower diesel engines start up, and Minka starts her slow crawl. Minka scoops up old railway sleepers with her hydraulically powered forks. As soon as the working sleeper section is full, Minka's gantry cranes swing into action. These mobile cranes move at speeds of up to 20 kilometers per hour right along the whole length of Minka's back. They swoop in and carry off the old sleepers on flatbeds. Once they've deposited their load, they pick up new sleepers and rush them straight back to the working section. But one of the cranes isn't moving fast enough. It's a serious problem. One of the workers dashes to the office to bring in Hannes. <laughs> Hannes gets straight on the case, pausing only to avoid an unplanned haircut, courtesy of the other working crane. The mechanics find an electrical fault that has put the crane out of action. Until they fix it, this railway is on the road to nowhere.
Dallas, Texas. Dallas-Fort Worth International, one of the world's busiest airports. Every day, almost a thousand planes land and take off. 160,000 passengers pass through. Since the devastating terrorist attacks of 9-11, this bustling hub has been at the front line of the war on terror. As director of public safety, Alan Black is tasked with handling the threat. We're always watching for uh, anybody that looks suspicious. For Alan, the nightmare scenario is a plane packed with passengers and fuel smashing into the Fort Worth runway. And his airport has to be able to handle the worst that can happen. For the ultimate disaster, you need the ultimate firefighting machine. Striker, the cutting edge of life-saving firefighting technology. Length, 14 meters, speed, 120 kilometers per hour, weight, 58 tons. With eight-wheel drive for rapid access to crashes on or off the runway, Striker races where other fire trucks fear to tread. Built-in cannons dispense 4,500 gallons of water and firefighting foam at record-breaking speeds to quench the fiercest of raging infernos. Crew, Captain David Mosley, one of three firefighter brothers at DFW, the man in charge of the firefighting fleet. It'll almost do more firefighting capability than we're gonna need to put out. Firefighter Cody Smith, the newest member of the crew, is a man on a mission. I'm here because 9-11 happened. That's why I got into the job. Firefighter Jennifer Vegas, the GI Jane of the fire crew. There's no way I would try this in my car. I a brand new fleet of strikers, the 4500 model, has recently arrived at DFW. The airport fire crews are just getting to grips with the state-of-the-art technology. And the airport is about to hit the midsummer weekend, one of the busiest travel times of the year. Terrorist threat levels have been high for weeks. It's vital that the crews are ready to use the strikers. Being prepared for disaster is a matter of life and death. We have to train and prepare like today's the day that we're going to have that crash. Today, the striker crews face an exercise that will prepare them for Alan Black's nightmare scenario. For our training drill today, we're going to have two pit fires. We're going to have the strikers come in. Cody, you're going to be on the 42 on the striker. And when you come in, split the hose line. We'll try and knock as much of the fire down as quick as you can. And then what we'll do is we'll come in with the hose lines, hook up to each of the trucks, and we'll mop up with the hand lines on the ground crews. That's pretty much it. So let's just go ahead and get bunkered out and Knock it out. First behind Striker's wheel is firefighter Cody Smith. All right, here we go. All right, on the ground, we're ready for training. Let me know when you're ready for a burn. I've got my pumping gauge. I've got my turret where I want it. Once I get down there, I'll be ready to go. Cody's first challenge is to get Stryker across one of the world's largest airports within a three-minute critical limit. All right, we're going to flame. Airport fire cover has to be able to reach a crash anywhere in the perimeter within this time to save lives. Flame is on. Within seconds of the plane crashing, burning jet fuel can reach a staggering 980 degrees Celsius. Every moment is vital. You can start fighting fire. The eight 1.3 meter high wheels burn rubber. In under 30 seconds, this multi-million dollar fire truck is storming down the runway. In spite of its 58-ton weight and carrying enough water to fill a small swimming pool, Stryker races along the airport access roads at 120 kilometers per hour. 30 seconds after impact. In a plane crash, fire will have already spread to the cabin and passengers would start to taste the smoke and feel the heat. 
The need for speed is very real.